Because I'm not hoping you go and ask to be promised, Okay. Okay, maybe we could just like say that. I think that would be good too. I'm on YouTube. Do you want me to? <laughs> practically famous, Don. Huh? You're practically famous. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I gotta figure out how to use YouTube. Okay. I will Are we on YouTube you. now? Should I tell all of my family <laughs> <laughs> to get on it right Apparently away? you are. <laughs> oh my God. This is how I go viral through microflow edicts. Yeah, this you just it. gotta this is my they keep talking. <laughs> just have to do something funny, right? <laughs> I'm going to um, go get some syringe pumps. <laughs> Just bring whatever, like all you have. And, and so it's a show time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, um, so Thomas, where, where can I get the link? I just on the YouTube. It in Slack. Okay, cool. Okay. Is that for the YouTube stream? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to post If you right click on out. the down arrow beside the YouTube, it'll let you copy it. Oh, okay. I'm learning fast. <laughs> hey, Thomas, could you just unmute the other guests or does it say ask to unmute for you? Uh, I can unmute. Oh, so I think as a co-host, it's us. I could only request. Oh, that is interesting. I could ask some mutes, some guests to unmute and I could unmute some other guests. Why is that? Oh, never mind. It might it was be just a one on person. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, it yeah, depends okay. on if they have their mute yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Force <laughs> down through. I think everybody is just. Huh. So everybody's. Right now, the question is, the question is, do we have speakers? <laughs> mm, look like it. I yeah. asked them to arrive five minutes earlier. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we have the slides already? We have the slides already. Okay, just in case. Okay, just post it. Um, wait, how do I? Hmm. Okay, for uh, for job board, we're going to have one slide for each company. 
And then uh, we collect uh, all of the job description links to a document, and then we're going to post the, the links to, to the chat awesome. so everybody can see it. Say Karthik is on. Uh, let me see. I haven't yep. seen. You just came on there. Oh, wanna, nice. Wanna make sure he's on. Okay. Oh, hey, hey, Karthik. Hey. We can't hear ah, you. There you go. You have to unmute oh, him. fantastic. Oh, there he is. <laughs> hey, how's it going, guys? Not bad. Good. Not bad. Right. Good. Good. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny, Karthik and I talked many times before, but this is the first time we I know. <laughs> saw each other. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like we talk over on the phone, on the Zoom many times. And, yeah, I never turned yeah. my camera on. I guess I didn't have a nice green screen behind me. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pity I don't have anything good to share on it either. So that's that's unfortunate, but... It looks pretty good. It looks like you're Simulation in Simulation a... people don't have a nice thing to show, then who does? Well, if I... If I if I play something behind me, then nobody's going to pay attention to my talking. <laughs> There's some cool models behind there, you know? He has too many cool stuff to show. <laughs> cool. And um, you have used Zoom so many times, but so just want to make sure, would you would you like to sh um, just try sharing the screen? Oh, sure, see yeah. If this uh, works. Actually, I'm already in presentation mode, so let me just see if I can... Are you able to see my screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. There you go. Great. Cool. Awesome. Beautiful. Okay, I'll keep an eye out for Carl. Oh, let's see. Carl says he needs the link for the meeting. Uh, oh, it's on the huh. okay. Yeah, it's on the here. calendar invite. Oh, so yeah, I think I tried clicking on the join Zoom meeting button from Google, and I think that didn't work. So I had to go into the invite and click the link. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's what he needs. Hmm. Copy that. Oh. Are you sending the link to him, Don? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Should work. Hopefully that works. Make sure I have the right calendar event. <laughs> <laughs> so to another meeting. Um, Karthik, just let you know the event is being recorded as we are we talked about before, and also we're live streaming it on YouTube. Oh wow, that's nice. <laughs> All the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See if they got that. Hi, Mark. How's it going, Sarah? Good, good. Mark. Good. How are you doing? <laughs> good. Are you? Good. 
Is that Don too? I see Don. Yeah, man. Yeah, cool. Hanging out. How you doing? <laughs> oh, I think they muted you again. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Working from home, yep. <laughs> yeah, some of the guys get to hang out on top of the mountains around the Bay Area. I'm still in my library. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, cool. Yeah, people are rolling in good. Oh, okay. I saw Kyle just joined. Oh, really? Okay. I saw his name. Um, let's see. Where'd he go? There he is. Yep. Yeah, I can't uh, unmute. Oh, there, there he is. Hey, Carl. Oh. Okay, great. Yeah, hey, sorry Carl. about that. I couldn't find the right. uh, link for the meeting. Yep. Cool. That was quick thinking. Pulled it out of my calendar. <laughs> Good to go. Yeah. Cool. Bye. Welcome. Great. And uh, we are right on time, so we can get us cool. started. And there are. 52 participants right now and then uh, I think um, more people will start joining and as we go um, we can start with the introduction first. Okay so is that me? Or um, I, it will be two seconds let me let me share my screen. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, how you how does this work? And, uh, so Thomas, can you share your screen? Or uh, let me let me download. Oops. Sorry about it. Let's see. There you go. Okay, fantastic. Um, somehow we are seeing the. This is not the projection view. Upper left. Let me see if I can download the slides. And... Here's this presenter view. There you go. Okay. Um, we can get started. This is good. And welcome everyone to the our virtual event tonight. And um, so this is the Bay Area Microfluidics Network and second virtual event. And, and to begin with, I wanted to give an introduction about the team and who has been putting a lot of efforts and to organize this event. And, um, so we started about three years ago and we wanted to foster a good community in local Bay Area, um, Bay Area region. And uh, so what we, do we do, we, we want to do connections and connect academia into, uh, with the industry to foster collaborations and partnership. We also want to uh, connect with some prospective employees and also the company so can connect a match of talent and talent needs. And, and also we want to connect the people who are in the fields already and also who are people who are interested in microfluidics and we want to get into the field and to know about it and where we can bring together new ideas together. Um, so we have currently the organization team have a, a team of five. So my name is Ya Tian Chu, and um, I'm a senior microfluidics professional, and I'm currently working in Bay Area. Um, so the rest of the team members, and um, we all have our video on. So please introduce yourself. And so maybe you can start with Thomas. So I'm Thomas. I'm a uh, I'm a fifth year bioengineering PhD candidate at Berkeley. And then we have Adam. I'm Adam, uh, I recently finished my PhD and now I'm working as a senior systems engineer at a small company called Full Moon Sensors. 
Yes, Samira. Samira. Hi, I'm Samira. I am the director of engineering at Casper Biotech and in San Francisco. Hi everyone, uh, I am Anushka. I'm a fourth year uh, PhD candidate in the bioengineering department at UC Berkeley. Awesome. And um, so all of us are the co-hosted today. So you can see our name popped up on the first and uh, few of us on the participant list. And so if you have any questions and just feel free to ping us. And, and um, as I mentioned, this is our second virtual event previously for people who are familiar with our format who have been doing a lot in networking events. And since what we really want to bring to the um, benefits to the community is to um, foster this community and the network. We have been doing events about every quarter and uh, so populating at a different locations in, in the Bay Area. Um, last, Last month on April 16th, we did our first virtual event and it was very well received. Um, we received a lot of good feedback from, from the audience. And so that encouraged us to keep continuing doing the virtual event. And uh, today we have a really exciting topics and especially given the special time and a lot of us still want to advance the research and development in microfluidics and, and how do we use and simulations to help with those development. And that's something will be very interesting to think about and to discuss in, in today's event. And, um, so we do have uh, two very um, amazing speakers today to share about their experiences. And um, if we can go to the next slide, Thomas. Let's see, to see today's agenda. Just one moment. PowerPoint never makes things easy. Uh, let me share mine. Okay. All right, and we'll have it up. See, there we go. There's a okay. Uh, I can share mine from here. Yeah, I got it again. Oh, okay, awesome. fantastic, great, great, and uh, sorry about that for tonight's agenda and first off for our introduction, we will have our first keynote speaker, Professor Carl Menhart from UC Santa Barbara in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And then our second speakers is Karthik Ramasawami and from Flow Science and he's a senior CFD engineer. And um, after that, we will have a 30 minutes of panel discussion moderated by Dr. Don Arnold. And so we will have a deeper discussion with the speakers. And uh, at the end of the event, we will have a job board session. And so um, spoiler alert, we actually have many job posting today. And so if you are looking for opportunities, and so please stay around uh, to the end. So we will post all of the job postings to, to the chat. And afterwards, and then we have a networking in breakout room. So this is something we're trying uh, a new format to do the virtual networking. So we can keep you know, connected with the people in this special time. Um, so we will try something maybe slightly different than the previous one. And uh, we would love to hear feedback from everyone who attended. And so how this is something we're still experimenting. So if you like it or something you don't like it, please let us know so we can keep improving. Um, next, um, so to stay connected with us and, and um, if you are new to our organization and you can go to the, the most direct way to stay connected with us is to go through our website. So it's a Bay Area Microfluidics Network.org. And so from there, you can see all of our new events information and also sign up our mailing list. And also if you want to contact us, you can reach us at hello at Bay Area Microfluidics Network.org. And we also have a LinkedIn group and uh, we currently sharing posts about this event. Um, and also we have our next virtual event, which will be coming in a month from now on June 18th. So sign up our mailing list or check our website so you can stay in tune for the next event. Cool.
And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Thomas. So he will talk about the virtual event guidance and how to participate in, uh, and do the Q&A. So uh, some brief guidelines. So everyone will, everyone will be muted until the 6 p.m. networking session, um, unless you want to ask a question, in which case, please type the question in the chat. And then when the time comes, we will unmute you and invite you to ask your question out loud. Um, one other note, please change your name uh, if you haven't already to your real name. Uh, it makes it much easier to see who uh, we're speaking to and who we're uh, in the room with. Um, and then if you'd like, you can also put your affiliation or your company in parentheses after your name. So I'll go over the networking session in more detail uh, right before it starts. Um, but if at any point you decide, oh, in the networking session, I really want to talk to so-and-so, uh, just shoot me a message, um, Thomas, and uh, ask to talk to that person, and then I can set you up in the same breakout room. And then lastly, if you run into any issues with Zoom, just send a private message to Anushka, and she will help you out. So this is if you're new to Zoom, which, uh, three months in, you may or may not be. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, send the question to everyone in the chat and uh, we will pick up on that and uh, we will moderate the questions. Again, if you have questions about how to use Zoom, send it to Anushka. And if you have a question, or if you'd like to speak to someone in specific, in particular, uh, send, those send that to me. And that is for later. So we are all ready to get started. So turn over to Adam. A quick introduction uh, for Dr. Meinhart. He's a professor of mechanical engineering at UC Santa Barbara. He completed his PhD and postdoc work at the University of Illinois in June 1995. When he was at University of Illinois, his research involved investigation of turbulent flows. Since coming to UCSB, his research has focused on developing microfluidic devices and exploring their fundamental transport mechanisms. Professor Meinhardt's group pioneered the concept of free surface microfluidics in collaboration with Professor Martin Moskowitz's group in chemistry at UCSB and their respective students. They have developed a novel technique for measuring gas phase chemicals with very high sensitivity. Uh, Dr. Meinhardt is also a fellow of the American Physical Society. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to him for uh, what promises to be a great talk. All right, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could see everyone in person up in the Bay Area, but um, it is what it is, right? So uh, next best thing. All right, so let me see if I can share my screen. All right, can, can everyone see my screen, the title slide? Yeah, okay, all right, super. So yeah, so I wanna talk about two topics today. I have uh, 20 minutes, uh, or I guess 15 minutes, so I'll go through them fairly quickly, but give you an overview. I wanna talk about two topics. The first topic is free surface microfluidics uh, for trace vapor detection. And that's a project that we've done at UCSB. Uh, and then also I wanna talk about uh, another project, which is kind of fun. Uh, it's simulation of the world's fastest valve, the fastest microfluidic valve. Uh, which was actually done with a company that uh, uh, that I founded called Numerical Design, uh, which is a consulting company for microfluidics. We do a lot of simulation as well as uh, fabrication. And there's a picture of uh, UC Santa Barbara, in case uh, anyone wants to come visit at some point. Okay, so yes, just a little background. I've been at the UCSB for actually over 22 years now, uh, focusing on microfluidics and transport processes. And yes, microfluidics was around 22 years ago, believe it or not. Um, and uh, I do a lot of work with uh, Comsol. I have uh, over 18 years of experience with that. I have over 150, 000, 150 publications and over 10,000 citations, uh, and also a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, the, the company that uh, I work with is a numerical design. Uh, I founded that in uh, 2012. It's a Comsol certified consultants. I've actually I've been using Comsol for quite a few years, both at UCSB for research, my students, as well as uh, in industry. So 
so let's talk about uh, free surface microfluidics for trace chemical detection. Uh, so we're all familiar with this device that's, that's used for detection in um, airports, uh, and it's a sniffer dog. And if we want to engineer microfluidics to detect uh, chemicals in the vapor phase, uh, a dog is a good uh, system to learn from. Uh, for example, it has a lot of good features. Uh, one thing it has is a great sample collection device that's attached right on the end of its uh, brain, right? So this sample device is, is engineered to pull in molecules. It's wet. You can see there's some moisture there. It's wet for a reason, which we'll talk about. Um, it also has a very elaborate sample preparation system uh, inside. And then uh, last but not least, uh, engineering, uh, nature's engineered it such that it has even onboard data analysis center. So it doesn't need Wi-Fi capabilities to phone back into a, a data center. It just carries the data center with it. So it's very, very convenient. A lot, it's very quick processing. It doesn't have Wi-Fi latency times and things like that. So it's, it's a good system. Uh, and uh, from a scientific point of view, there's been a lot of talk about whether dogs can smell cancer or not. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we wanna explore that a little bit more. So we tried to utilize these concepts in free surface microfluidics. And so this is an example of a free surface channel. The blue part is, uh, is the free surface. And by doing it in microfluidics, it allows you to have very high surface to volume ratios, such that you can allow for molecules to partition through the surface. Uh, and it takes a very small amount of volume such that you can fill up a concentration. So even though there may be very trace amounts of molecules in the air, uh, it doesn't take a lot of molecules penetrating the surface to build up a concentration that can be detected in microfluidics. Um, if we use an example of dinitrotoluene, which is a, uh, a good molecule for explosives detection, uh, the selectivity of the surface itself allows for about five orders of magnitude of, um, hang on a second. Oh, <laughs> uh, five orders of magnitude of selectivity. So, Hydrophilic molecules can partition through the surface uh, much quicker than hydrophobic molecules. So it's a natural filter. Uh, these white particles are silver nanoparticles that flow through the system and combine with the uh, explosive molecules. Now, once uh, ex these explosive molecules enter the system, they can actually be concentrated by up to six orders of magnitude. Uh, and that's, you can basically work out Henry's law with this. And, and figure out that the uh, equilibrium concentration is six orders of magnitude. Now, this has been well known for many years uh, that liquids tend to collect chemicals in the air. Uh, that's why you don't want to leave your coffee cup in the chemistry lab and then drink it later. It's, it's not a good practice. So, um, but the equilibrium can take uh, many, many hours to build up, if not days to build up. But with microfluidics, when this stream is only a few microns deep, then you can build up concentrations in a matter of seconds instead of hours. So that's one of the tremendous advantages of microfluidics. When these particles go into the surface, they combine, they concentrate, and then they bind with these white nanoparticles, uh, we get a plasmonic event that occurs. So it stimulates an aggregation process where these nanoparticles will sandwich uh, a molecule. And when it becomes a dimer like this, then it becomes plasmonically resonant. And that amplifies the signal by uh, up to six to nine orders of magnitude. And so that amplification, amplified signal can be detected with a uh, Raman spectrometer. And we're using Raman spectroscopy, we can pull out a very specific pattern, which tells us the fingerprint of the molecule. So we get specificity. So we've combined a lot of lessons that we learned from a dog's nose uh, into this system. Uh, we get selectivity, the free surface behaves like a membrane to increase the concentration of the molecules. And then, uh, and then we use nanoparticles to actually, in Raman spectroscopy, to extract the signal. Or in a dog, a dog would use olfactory receptors and then send that data to the, uh, to the brain to do a pattern recognition to pull out the, uh, the specificity. Okay, so this is a layout of the uh, microfluidic device for chemical detection. Uh, and so we use the millimeter chips that we can interface with uh, laboratory instrumentation. And of course, inside that's the microfluidics. 
and the microfluidics allows us to control the aggregation process of the nanoparticles. And so all the action happens on the nanometer scale, but we need microfluidics to interface the real world to the nanometer scale. Uh, and what you see also on here are, are several types of uh, sensors, temp temperature sensors, RTDs, as well as um, humidity sensors. And then at the end of it is a, 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 a pump, a, a transpirational type pump. So when these nanoparticles get very, very close together and we hit this with light, we can actually simulate the plasmonic resonance using electromagnetic uh, simulation tools. Uh, and so as these nanoparticles approach a few nanometers, basically they act like antennas or lenses, the electromagnetic lenses that will focus the light, the, the radiation to these hotspots. And if there's a molecule in these hotspots, it, it uh, experiences a very, very intense electric field. And that electric field then um, allows us to get this tremendous enhancement of signal up to six to nine orders of magnitude. Okay. The other part that we simulate uh, in the nanochannels is the aggregation process. Uh, if the molecule, the red molecule, comes in contact with one nanoparticle, we'll get a certain signal. But the real, and you can see that here, you can see if there's just one particle, uh, there'll be a small electric field. But the real magic happens when we have two or, two or more uh, dimers or trimers uh, together, then they enhance, they interact with each other, they resonate. The electromagnetic field resonates, and that's what creates the, the tremendous amplification that we're looking for. And so it's really the dimers that we're after. So we want to take monomers, convert to dimers, to trimers, and so on. And this is where the sweet spot is for chemical detection. And we tend to model that as second order uh, chemical reactions, the aggregation events. Uh, and with that, and we can fit uh, one fitting parameter with DVLO theory to determine the, uh, the association constant. Uh, and so monomers turn to dimers, dimers combined with monomers turn to trimers and so on. And, and when they get to large clusters, eventually the signal will go away because then there's just too much electromagnetic interference. Um, so with this system of equations, second order re chemical reactions, we can actually simulate uh, the reaction kinetics as a function of position. So the microfluidics allow, normally these things happen over time, but with microfluidics, we can replace the time axis uh, with position. And so, uh, so this basically is the lifetime of the, of the, uh, the process. And, and so as we go downstream in the microfluidic channel, uh, we will get a, an enhancement event, and then, uh, and then this enhancement will start to decay away as we get larger and larger aggregates. And this was reported PNAS a number of years ago. So with that, we can tune the system and we can detect uh, explosive molecules. So the DNT molecule that we talked about before, it's basically a breakdown product of, uh, of trinitrotoluene or TNT. Uh, and you may remember uh, ACDC had a song about TNT a few years ago. So, um, so anyway, so TNT is, uh, is a very important molecule for explosive detection. And we can plot signatures of this within a matter of tens of seconds even if the concentration is one part per billion in the air. Okay, uh, and so what we're working on now is we're trying to combine this with photonics. So the microfluidics is integrated in a chip, uh, but the Raman spectrometer is off chip. And so the idea is can we uh, develop a Raman spectrometer that is in a, in, a, in a photonic system and do everything in a single integrated system? So the idea is to have a glass-based microfluidics on top, or it could even be silicon uh, with the uh, Raman spectroscopy being IR, which would be trans uh, transparent through silicon. Um, so the, these are some of the uh, uh, ideas that we're working on. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'd like to shift topics quickly to uh, the world's fastest microfluidic valve. Okay, how do you make the world's fastest valve? Of course, the answer to this group, everyone knows it's microfluidics, right? Make it smaller, it becomes faster, usually. Uh, and so a number of people have, have worked on these valves, like the Quake groups worked on it, Matthew's group in Berkeley have pioneered valves as well. Uh, and uh, for example, these normally closed valves, and you apply, uh, apply a pneumatic, pneumatic actuation, you can open up a membrane, allow the fluid to pass. And, and these valves work very well for certain, um, certain processes. 
Uh, typical frequencies are on the order of 10 to 20 hertz, maybe 100 hertz at some point. Um, but what if we want to do better than that? What if we want to get to uh, uh, 1,000 times a second? Is that possible? So that's what we're going to look at. And this work was done uh, off campus. This was actually a commercial um, venture with Al Biomedical, which was a spin out of uh, IMT in Santa Barbara. Uh, and so let's try to look at how they did it. So IMT came up with this idea after probably about 15, 20 years ago. Um, amazing how time flies. But the idea is to have a magnetic pole uh, where there's a solenoid and that solenoid uh, creates a magnetic field. This pole actually is a lens that focuses the magnetic field down to the micron scale. So the pole is microfabricated. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a, a a uh, ferromagnetic material that's placed inside this object that is receptive to the magnetic field. When this magnetic field is actuated, uh, it will actually pull this armature, this uh, ferromagnetic material, it'll deflect it. When this deflects, there's a, a spring integrated in silicon that then pulls this towards the magnetic pole. And this is the, uh, the valving part. So rather than the flow coming in this way and then leaving through the depth of this device, this is pulled over. This, um, um, this, this part will move in. It'll take the flow and deflect, deflect it out into a sorting channel. So that's the idea. Uh, and the question is, how fast can you make this? Uh, how do you engineer this? And then how do you, and then you fab it? And then how, how fast can you actually make it go? Faster, the better. Um, and so this is what the actual valve looks like. So you can see it's, it is, uh, quite small, fits on the tip of your fingertip. And you can tell that because of the small length scale, it's incredibly hard to, um, to see actually what's going on, to visualize it. So we really have to do, do the simulations and design numerically. Okay, so how do we do that? So, um, so the approach, because it's a very complicated geometry, uh, it's uh, drawn in SolidWorks, and then there's a live link that allows us to directly import that in the console. Uh, we have to do 3D nonlinear magnetics because these ferromagnetic materials are highly nonlinear. The BH curve is incredibly nonlinear. So it's uh, quite difficult to get it to converge. The, the fluid mechanics, the physics involved in this is three-dimensional fluid structure interaction. Uh, and then also we use particle tracing to uh, look at the Lagrangian uh, fields, look at the, uh, the the, the tracing fields of the particles. Uh, to solve this thing fully 3D, time dependent, it takes uh, one to four days, depending upon the degree of difficulty, and that's 32 processors. So it's a, a fairly involved simulation. Um, it takes about 64 gigs of memory, and, uh, and it runs, uh, it has to remesh, because as this thing moves, uh, it deforms the mesh, and then the mesh has to remesh because it'd be too distorted. Uh, and it takes about 60 to 80 remeshes to make this thing flow. Okay, so, um, so if we simulate the electromagnetics, we, use, um, uh, we simulate the coils, uh, we simulate using uh, Ampere's law to get the magnetic fields. And this is just some details of console solver, but it takes special uh, uh, 3D iterative solvers for us to convert. And, um, and one of the, um, the numerical algorithms, uh, Juan, you'll appreciate it's the, the Vanka solver. You may have, you may have heard of the, uh, the Vanka solver before. Um, okay, so let's, uh, it's an iterative solver. And then also there's an auxiliary max, space Maxwell solver. Um, this is what the magnetic fields look like. Uh, the maximum is about 1.6 Tesla. And if you zoom into the, the armature, the magnetic pole, you can see the magnetic fields get focused. And the magnetic force is based upon a divergence of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field coming in to this, uh, this uh, ferromagnetic material uh, is very focused and then it diverges out. And that diverging uh, field lines is what actually gives it a net force. And we can calculate that net force uh, quite accurately. And then we use that as a, uh, as a driver for the, the, uh, um, uh, for the fluid structure interaction. So the fluid structure interaction, we solve, of course, the uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, uh, fully nonlinear. Uh, have to solve for the structural mechanics as well, right? So the second order in time for structural mechanics, the displacement field, 
and it's a highly deformed structural mechanics. So we have to use finite uh, deformation uh, elasticity. Um, and, and that is also combined with uh, arbitrary Euler Lagrangian uh, field, uh, the ALE formulation, because the mesh deforms. So this, as this thing moves, the mesh is deforming. And so you have to solve the fluid mechanics in a deformed mesh and then project it back to an undeformed mesh. So all this physics is solved simultaneously. Um, and this is an example of what the, a typical mesh looks like. And this is a fully three-dimensional problem uh, because the flow is actually moving over and around this, uh, the amateur, armature as it moves. Okay, so this is, hopefully this will play. Uh, and you guys can see this. So you can see as, as the magnetic is actuated, it deflects, the flow goes into the other stream, and, and then it comes back out. And it takes about 12 microseconds for this to open. And so there's a lot of balancing. So you, you design this such that there's not weird fields going on at the tip of this, uh, as well as you, you design the, the strength of the magnetic field coupled with the strength of the spring. So, this, so once it's released, the spring can pull it back without weird effect. So this is a result of many, many iterations to optimize. And the velocities are on the order of uh, 10 meters a second inside this thing. So now you can see the flow is going through the sorting channel again. And then once the sort's over, it's released, the, the spring pulls it back to the rest position. All right, so, so here's just um, some examples at two microseconds. Um, it's starting to move, four microseconds, you can see it move. After six microseconds, it's, it's moving relatively quickly. Uh, eight, almost full. And then at 10, it's full, fully open. Uh, and 12, it's at 12 is at the fully open position. So, um, so this is tuned such that it can open and close on command and, and very quickly. So the idea is that uh, this thing can actually sort uh, in about, uh, uh, in about uh, it can sort about 55,000 cells per second, which is about, so it's used as a cell sorter. So once you have the world's fastest valve, how do you use it, right? And so what they've done is they commercialized this um, cell sorting technology. And this was bought, Al was bought by uh, Milton a number of years ago. Um, so with that, I want to, I want to play one of their uh, uh, little videos that kind of, little promo videos that kind of explain how it's used. And hopefully this will, will play okay. Uh, hang on one second. Can you guys hear the uh, audio? Any? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the audio of the computer? Your video, the audio of your video? Yes. Um, no, I am not hearing it. Okay. Wonder if I, I could. Hear it. Where do I adjust that? That will be if you click on the arrow next to mute. Um, there's an option to. Uh, okay. Yeah. Share. Um, it says leave computer audio. Audio settings. It might be in the sharing settings, a little by the green sharing toolbar. Okay, uh, let's see here. Hang on. Uh, turn it up and use the same microphone. That's probably a good idea. Yeah, okay, I think I'll have to do that. What would we? I don't think we computer audio yeah, is the right option. That was the wrong thing. I think one of the suggestions are if you click the small button next to the mute option, and if you select same as system for select a microphone, Instead of the built-in microphone, I guess there's an option that says same as system. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and maybe also the same for the speaker. Select oh, the speaker. Oh, same as system. I should use yeah. that one. 
Uh, yeah, I think so. We could we could try it out. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's try this again. Can you hear that? No. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'll just play. I think I'll have to uh, just resign and. Uh... <laughs> the, uh, the definitive answer is if you want to do is get to end the screen share, and then when you start it again, there's a checkbox at the bottom of the window that says share oh, computer okay. audio. All right. Let's try that. Share computer sim. Ah, there we go. All right, excellent. So, learning uh, microfluidics and Zoom. <laughs> the new Max Cognito is the world's first. You hear that? Yeah. High speed closed system cell sorter. Taito employs a unique closed and disposable cartridge system that utilizes a patented microchip containing the world's fastest valve, capable of safely sorting up to 200 million cells per hour. Cells flow rapidly through the chip where they're interrogated by three lasers. The fluorescent and scattered light signatures are used to determine which cells are to be sorted. To sort, a powerful magnetic field is applied that opens the microchip valve, redirecting the desired cells into a closed sort collection chamber. The title sorts these cells with high fidelity, high speed, and high viability. The MaxQuant Taito offers a rapid and efficient way to sort living cells that is easy to use, aerosol-free, promises to revolutionize cell sorting for medical researchers in life science research and cell therapy. All right, so, um, okay. So that's the, uh, that's the Max, uh, the, the Taito. And uh, yeah, so it, it uses a very novel microfluidic valve. Uh, it's not, deformable materials except for silicon and silicon is a deformable material if you make it um, um, sufficiently thin it can actually make a very good spring and of course we're familiar with MEMS oscillators right so they're basically springs and mass systems uh, but it's not permeable like PDMS so it has some some really good advantages and uh, and it can do some very unique capabilities very high speed you can tune this uh, you know running 55,000 times a second basically so, so it's pretty cool. So, and this is a commercial product now. So it's another example of a successful MEMS product, but it did take uh, 15 plus years before it actually saw commercial, um, commercial results. So, um, so with that, uh, conclusions, a uh, pioneer did some free surface microfluidics, uh, have a, a, been able to use that for some novel trace chemical detection, and then also worked on the world's fastest valve. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, many of my collaborators on all these projects. And with that, I'll turn it over for the next talk. All right, uh, we can move on to the next speaker. And since we're running um, a little bit behind the time, and so we saw some questions here, and uh, we will address those questions in our discussion session. Thank you, Carl. I'll hand it over to Adam for the introduction of our next speaker. Okay. So for our next speaker, we have Karthik Ramiswamy. He's a fluid, uh, sorry, a senior computational fluid dynamics engineer with Flow Science Inc., where he leads some of the modeling efforts in the multi-physics domain. His focus area is the use of CFD to investigate and solve problems in microfluidics, biomedical engineering, complex fluids, and consumer product manufacturing. Karthik holds a master's in aerospace engineering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he focused primarily on experimental fluid dynamics and turbulence using techniques such as particle image velocimetry. Uh, so let's welcome Karthik and I look forward to your talk. Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Is everyone able to see my presentation screen? Yes. Perfect, great, thank you. So thanks a lot, Adam, again, and thanks uh, everyone at Bay Area Microfluidics Group to uh, to have us here today. It's it's really a nice feeling to, to be presenting this stuff to you. So uh, my talk was originally titled Microfluidics with Flow3D, but I, I figured 
based on a lot of the things we do, I figured it was also going to be free surface microfluidics. Uh, you know, following uh, Dr. Meinhardt's excellent talk, uh, I thought I could show you a different dimension in terms of in the way we model things uh, uh, and look at some of the application areas as well. So. Like Adam mentioned, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, my name is Karthik, and I'm a senior CFD engineer, and I focus mainly on multiphysics problems here, including uh, many different things pertaining to, uh, to microfluidics. So I wanted to give you a brief overview about uh, the volume of fluid method, which is primarily what we use, uh, as well as flow science, the organization. Uh, those of you familiar with the Los Alamos National Labs, the, uh, the technology essentially originated in the T3 group, which is the fluid mechanics group back in the 80s. Uh, following which, uh, you know, a lot of the initial work was done used uh, based on this method called the marker and cell method. Uh, and then the WAF method evolved from that and sort of the commercialization of that happened in the form of Flow Science, which is the organization uh, that I work for. Uh, Dr. Tony Hurt, uh, who's the founder of the original volume of fluid method, uh, sort of commercialized the technology with this company. Um, and then the first version of the solver, the Flow 3D solver, um, was uh, launched in... Um, uh, in 1985, and so since then, uh, the evolution has been quite uh, quite interesting to to see um, uh, in terms of uh, you know how the capabilities as well as the visualization uh, technologies have evolved. So today, uh, a lot of the applications that we do pertain to uh, civil infrastructure, uh, you know, macro scale problems, uh, manufacturing such as high pressure die casting, you know, very turbulent flows. Uh, this filling process essentially happens within a fraction of a second, um, and and there's a lot of heat transfer, solidification, all sorts of physics going on in here. Um, and then additive manufacturing is another big up and coming field, uh, a lot of interest in that domain. So like, you know, direct energy deposition uh, example shown here, for instance, is, uh, you know, you have a particle uh, field here with a, with a heat source that melts, uh, melts it and solidifies onto a substrate. So today's uh, topic, of course, is on microfluidics. So I just, you know, most of the applications where we see simulation being used also are, are sort of the usual suspects, uh, you know, IVD, uh, drug delivery, point of care devices, uh, but consumer products and inkjets also have our domains that employ microfluidic technologies, um, uh, but maybe are not associated nearly uh, as immediately with, with those. So if I take something like a lab on a chip application, there's, uh, you know, a lot going on there in terms of, um, uh, you know, all the kinds of physics that are happening, right, from sample deposition. Uh, so you have surface tension, visco viscous effects that come into the picture, uh, and you have propagation through microchannels. Uh, you could have porous uh, materials in there. Uh, you know, you could have uh, electromechanics and so on and so forth. So uh, a, a lot of different physical aspects can, can be a part of this. So uh, for us, like I said, we deal primarily with free surface flows. So, you know, what do some of these applications look like? Um, you know, we've done some cases here where you have uh, sort of droplet deposition uh, on a fiber bed where you can actually resolve the, the topography of the fiber bed with tomographic imaging and actually understand the equilibrium dynamics of, of surface tension and, and viscosity and so on. Uh, you could have interfacial fluids where you have uh, you know, multiple fluids, like a sheet fluid here for this um, uh, droplet generator uh, flow focusing example. Uh, you can have electromechanical effects that manipulate the contact line. Uh, so if you're thinking about designing something like a uh, variable focal length liquid lens, for instance, for optical focusing, uh, something like that could, could be captured with simulation. Uh, slightly more microscopic, but if you're looking at a coating application, so this one here is a roll coating problem uh, where you have a ribbing instability being formed uh, as a result of a different capillary uh, number operating regime, for instance. Um, and then thermal ink jets, this is sort of one of those most more classical application areas for us, uh, you know, where you have droplet generation. Uh, these are so prevalent now, I'm sure you guys use one at your uh, home or work, you know, in the form of a printer. Uh, but then this is also now being expanded into different territories. And then particle sorting, of course, is another area where based on the mass and, and, and dimensions or, or diameters, you can have gravity or drag based sorting as well. So I wanted to give you a brief overview about you know, what we do differently with, with the volume of fluid method for free surface flows. So uh, Flow 3D in general is a, is a Navier-Stokes fully transient uh, nonlinear solver, uh, but we treat volume, we treat free surface uh, interfaces with what's called the volume of fluid method, or uh, like we call it the true of method because sort of it was the original uh, VOF method that came out. So uh, the main challenge with free surface problems is essentially applying the right boundary conditions at this fluid interface. So this, this cartoon here shows, you know, if you have a, a liquid here, you can have a, a gaseous region surrounding it or, or second fluid. Uh, but the main idea is uh, the technique or, or the approach that you use to apply that boundary condition uh, can uh, 
change or affect the quality of resolution or, or even the computation time for instance. So, uh, you know, we have a one fluid VOF approach where this void zone is treated as a uniform pressure region, uh, or alternatively, you can solve the full dynamics by, you know, looking at it as a full two fluid solution where you have a full velocity field that's being solved for, uh, you know, inside this domain. So that's the basic free surface dynamics. And then on top of that, uh, you can have all sorts of auxiliary models, depending on the kind of uh, physical problem you're trying to solve. So electromechanics could be one of them, something like porous media could apply as well. And then post processing and visualization is, is a part and parcel of any commercial code, uh, and very important. So you know, we have a dedicated post processor for that as well. So I have a few case studies that I'm going to go over, uh, you know, hopefully I don't take too too much time. Um, and we can finish this. But the uh, the first one was sort of more basic in terms of uh, you know showcasing uh, flow inside a microchannel uh, uh, with a V notch in there. So uh, what's really interesting about this is that if you have POC type devices where you want to transmit uh, free surface flows like blood, for instance, from one end to the other, uh, you want to do this spontaneously without any external driving in some cases. So uh, capillary forces can be very powerful, and then of course viscous forces do tend to resist that. So it's always a, an equilibrium type condition, uh, and the the contact angle model in flow 3D is fully dynamic, so it can capture what what these uh, conchus fin filaments look like based on the geometrical constraints are in the system. Um, and what this allows you to do uh, you know, is then establish some sort of a, a parametric study and, and see what sort of geometric variations uh, you can push and design some of these uh, uh, these devices. So this particular case, uh, you know, this was done by some researchers in, in uh, the University of Grenoble and the University of Buffalo, if, I'm, if I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, they compared some of their simulation results with the WAF method to uh, the experimental measurements. They quantified this as well uh, through actual tests. And you know the match is you know, really good, both in terms of computing what the velocities would look like, uh, as well as the distance traversed uh, by the blood. Um, so you know, something with uh, sort of looking at complex dynamics of surface tension um, you know, and based on the fluid properties. The other advantage of this is you can then use the same approach to move really high viscosity fluids as well. I believe they tested it out on something that was about two or of magnitude larger than that of blood, and uh, it seemed to work for that. So, you know, very promising there. Uh, slightly different application. Uh, if you're, you know, looking at a capillary a sort of dripping type problem, uh, this was an, a really interesting study that came out of the University of Illinois in Chicago um, about looking at, at comparing two different sort of um, uh, pinch off dynamics when you have, you know, flow dripping from this uh, capillary tube. So what's happening here is you have a balance of inertial capillary and viscocapillary forces. And the way this droplet pinches off uh, actually changes depending on the fluid rheology and the properties. So uh, this is a high viscosity case. Uh, I know that it looks like this is taking longer, but this video is actually slower. Uh, but the mechanic, the mechanics here at the end of this time frame, for instance, you have you know no satellite droplets, no necking, whereas in this case you kind of have that uh, that other thing here. So the the goal was to try and understand whether the WAF method can can predict um, uh, or can actually capture this in simulation. So. Um, they actually did some experiments as well. They had a CCD high-speed camera, uh, compare that with the simulation results and you know, matches pretty good. Uh, but then they also quantified what this looks like. So they, they looked at the normalized uh, um, sort of length scale for the uh, neck formation uh, with, uh, with adjusted time essentially. So if you go from right to left, you see uh, you approach the pinch off uh, point. And so this was done initially uh, you know, with different concentrations of, of a water glycerol mixture. Uh, but what was really interesting is you know, the match is, is pretty evidently really good. And you can, uh, you can sort of see that you can use simulation to predict this. So once you have this, again, you know, sort of extend that to running different kinds of problems um, as well. So um, a slightly uh, different problem in this case, you know, with, with uh, micro total analysis systems, compact disk type platforms have uh, have come into the light quite often, uh, you know, uh, because of all the things you can fit into this. But of course, the other issue is that you're, it's a centrifugal platform. So you're gonna have a lot of centrifugal forces pushing the fluid radially outward. So uh, to optimize the amount of real estate with this, uh, one approach that was suggested was to try and utilize sort of the pneumatic energy. So the way the system works is you have this central cartridge somewhere closer to the center here. Uh, you load some sort of liquid, and then you have that, uh, as the rotation starts, you have it being pushed out because of centrifugal forces, uh, filling the channel. And then it gets trapped here because you now have a, a void or an air gap here as well as a bubble here. And then eventually as you increase the rotational speeds, there's some amount of compressibility. Um, you know, usually there's some amount of compressibility in the liquid as well as the gas. So you sort of, uh, 
it compresses and you have this pneumatic energy stored inside this, this bubble zone here. And then when you release it, the idea is that you use that coupled with the capillary forces to propel the fluid uh, back towards the center. So now you can manipulate liquids by controlling the rotational speeds of this platform. Um, so uh, this was a study that looked at this experimentally and we were like, oh, we, we should probably try seeing if you can actually predict uh, you know, what this would look like. So uh, we done a case, so this is just an, a simulation video uh, comparing the two. Uh, you know, This is a low RPM, so you can still see some minor oscillations, but it takes a while to come to this steady state condition, uh, whereas the higher RPM, it's, it's, mu it's much quicker. You can barely see any movement in this case. Um, but the idea was to use what, what we call the non-inertial reference frame model in, in the solver to apply a, a body force essentially to the entire domain and quantify the location of these free surfaces. So uh, we didn't exactly measure the velocity of, of the uh, 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 sort of shooting off of the float back towards the center, but rather just looked at it as a degree of compression. Uh, so the free surface profiles were uh, measured quantified and compute or compared with the experimental data from the from the research paper and uh, you know the match was pretty good it was well within around seven percent of measured data so uh, you know from a computational standpoint for engineering it's actually a very good match so the next goal this is actually an ongoing study that uh, you know I'm part of but uh, we wanted to compare this with uh, the benefits of doing a one fluid approach we use a two fluid approach in this case but it's, it's likely the one fluid approach is going to still measure this really well and do that uh, a lot more efficiently as well um, the study, different case study here, uh, this was courtesy of uh, Roche Diagnostics in Germany, um, and they were designing a bunch of microchannels for uh, uh, an advanced staining system. So you have a disposable flow cell device and you have uh, you know, some sort of a microscope slide inside with a tissue sample. And uh, this is used in a slightly different stage. This isn't a validation, but it's more to do sort of a concept exploration of what this device, uh, you know, how this device operates. So they took three different microchannel configurations um, and you know, rectangular, hexagonal, and this, this branching case here. Uh, and the idea was to evaluate this for effective fluid-fluid exchange, uh, efficient fluid-fluid exchange, and uh, you know, look at any other sort of 3D effects that might come into the picture, like bubble formation, for instance. So a good first step is always you know, validation. So this was more of a uh, visual comparison, essentially. But uh, the idea was to uh, you know, do some tests in the lab and try and see they have an aqueous liquid here. They're washing it through with a buffer of some sort, um, or water, I think, in this case. And they wanted to see if they can see where the free surface ends, or the free surface uh, ends up uh, you know, in time. So they did, they did that for this first case here. And the second one, they ended up doing it for uh, just a liquid filling up a channel. Uh, so you have an air fluid interface, and here you have a liquid-liquid interface. Um, so you know, slightly different approaches for both of these. We use what's called the scalar model here. Um, but uh, you know, did these preliminary analyses and then moved on to actually looking at the channels themselves. So uh, you know, just by looking at this, uh, these are all you know, normalized uh, time scale videos. But you see here that. Uh, the branching channel tends to take a little longer to fill. So once you quantify this, you actually do see that in measurements as well. Uh, and so the branching one was deemed to be inefficient in terms of liquid-liquid uh, exchange across uh, both the entire channel as well as uh, the tissue region right there. So. Um, so conceptually, that's a that's a good start. You don't have to go to the lab and do anything. You just use your simulation to inform that. And then you go and do some of these detailed simulations. So if I play this one here, uh, they decided to go with either the hexagonal or the rectangular. But then the filling of the hexagonal, they found this intermittent bubble formation uh, that tends to happen uh, as a result of, of void pressurization. So this is definitely not something you want to. And then you want to try and mitigate this somehow. So uh, you know, same with the rectangular channel, not quite too many issues at the beginning, uh, but then if I skip ahead a little bit here, as it fills the actual channel, uh, this is the inlet, by the way, if it wasn't clear, uh, but as it fills the actual channel, uh, you see some uh, sort of free surface, uh, I, I like to call them defects, not really defects, uh, sort of misflows here that that might cause uh, some inefficiencies in the in the channel. So, you know, good, good uh, scenario or application area to, to use simulation as well. And sort of the last case study um, that I wanted to show you was uh, with regard to magnetophoresis. We saw some really interesting, you know, particle simulations in the in the previous talk, um, but uh, this one was another case study. Uh, this was published, I think, in uh, Nature Scientific Reports last year, uh, where. Uh, 
the goal is to try and uh, detoxify uh, different kinds of samples with uh, the magnetophoretic uh, bead, essentially. So uh, the, for this analysis, the main goal was to try and understand what's the best modeling approach. So, you know, all of these uh, codes and tools have a lot of different physics, uh, but at the end of the day, you have to have a, a good semblance of understanding uh, what the best modeling approach is uh, for a certain problem. So in this case, uh, they had these, these small beads and you can model these as Lagrangian particles or you can model them as actual you know, moving objects. So the way we handle moving objects in Flow3D uh, is that we don't have deforming meshes. Uh, we have a fixed mesh approach, but we're still able to look at the full dynamics uh, of, uh, of different moving objects. So um, in this case, uh, with the Lagrangian particles model, they looked at, at a one-way coupling approach where you had uh, you know, the fluid, uh, the particles are affected by the fluid flow, but not vice versa. And the, a two-way coupling approach where the motion of the particles actually results or affects the, uh, the fluid flow itself. Um, so uh, the idea is that you have this channel and then you have blood coming in from one end uh, and then you have a, a buffer solution coming in on the other. Uh, and you have this interface that's formed here and you have these beads that you know, uh, bind to different toxins and you have a magnetic field created uh, with a strong elect like, like an electromagnet or something like that. Uh, and then magnetophoretic force separates out uh, these particles from the channel. So um, uh, what was interesting to see just from, a, from the point of view of you know, comparing this is that the the degree of magnetophoretic force actually uh, allows for separation in some cases and then doesn't work in some other cases. So you can identify those sorts of things. Uh, but from a modeling standpoint, what was also interesting is that uh, at higher um, um, magnetophoretic forces, the volume of the particle actually becomes very important. So the Lagrangian particles model, for instance, doesn't account for that. And so you have to do a much more detailed uh, moving object model uh, to actually capture that correctly. But uh, once you do that, you, you actually start to see differences. And then doing some of these iterative studies, uh, you know, they also saw that it didn't really make much of a difference for uh, going the one fluid to fluid coupling approach, essentially. So um, sort of an interesting, uh, you know, uh, insight into how you would want to set up your models in terms of degree of complexity. So that's sort of you know all I had uh, you know in the time I had uh, sort of a bit of a shameless plug here. We actually have a uh, microfluidics workshop coming up uh, the beginning of June. So if you're interested in trying some of these things hands on with the tool, uh, you know there's uh, there's a half day training session. Uh, you know we teach you how to do some of these basic uh, uh, setups for uh, microfluidics, uh, and then you know we also uh, provide like a 30 day license with that if you want to play around with it. Uh, but I mean I hope I was able to show you that you know some of these examples were very interesting. Um, and you can do a lot with this in terms of uh, exploring the parameter space, uh, design optimization, and, and sort of use it as a numerical uh, uh, testing platform. So uh, I think uh, that's about it. Thanks so much. Karthik, uh, could you put the link for your workshop in the chat, please? So that Absolutely, sure. Yep. Enjoy it. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Karthik, for the presentation and uh, let's move on to our panel discussion. And uh, I know some of you may have questions and so please save your questions in the panel discussion. And also as a reminder, so uh, please send the question into the chat, send to everyone. And then uh, we will call your name and so we can unmute you so you can ask your question to the, to the speakers. All right, uh, so I will hand it over to Adam to introduce our moderator. All right, let me pull up Don's bio. All right, uh, Dr. Don Arnold received his BA in chemistry from Cornell and a PhD from Berkeley studying chemical reaction dynamics and molecular spectroscopy. He did postdoc studies at USC with Professor Kurt Wittig and Professor Hanna Reisler studying molecule surface scattering dynamics. In 1997, he moved to Sandia National Laboratory as a technical staff member, where he changed his focus to development of microfluidics and microscale chemical analysis systems. Um, in May 2000, he founded a spin out based on this called Exigent Technologies and led that development effort, including winning an advanced technologies program grant. In 2007, he became a VP of business development and strategic alliances and played a key role in the sale of analytical instruments, 
business to AV SciX in February 2010. Uh, in 2017, he founded Veristad, where he is CEO and provides expert technical and business consulting for life science companies, assisting established companies during assessment of early stage technologies and assisting early stage tech companies as they navigate from startup to exit. He has over 50 publications and patents and has made numerous presentations at national and international scientific conferences and universities. So let's welcome Don and move on to our panel. Hey, great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Also, thanks to Karthik and uh, Carl for great presentations. Um, very enjoyable. And it's nice to, to meet you guys this evening. And uh, thanks to everybody on the participants showing up. I uh, see a lot of friend names in there, um, people from a lot of different backgrounds. So I'm going to basically spend just a couple of minutes uh, getting some questions through while people put their questions up in the chat. And, uh, and then after a little bit, we'll switch over and start taking questions from the audience. So let's get going. I think is uh, is kind of neat and ending up on the particles. One of the things I was thinking about, I know that uh, uh, both, I know Carl spent a lot of time working with uh, really small particles doing micro PIV before, and you were looking at magnetic particles and I know in my background playing around with particles, there's lots of different particles out there in general, you know, sizes, porosities, magnetic properties, things like that. Um, you know, where do you see the, the challenges when you're working in, in the simulations and dealing with the different types of particles? You know, to what level of detail can you dig down in there and really feel like you're dealing with the property of the particles specifically? And I think it was also in, in the, uh, the SIRS part of your presentation too, Carl. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for that question. So it really depends upon the size of the particles, right? So if they're, if they're nanoparticles, then there's a different set of physics that can govern them versus, um, um, versus micron sized particles. When they're like one micron in size, then you can use dielectrophoresis, um, uh, those types of forces that are not, real, are not really applicable at the nanoscale, right? And then at the nanoscale, you get more uh, diffuse uh, Brownian motion. Right, becomes very dominant. Um, the particles that I've dealt with for simulation, uh, like the nanoparticles, uh, done several types, like fluid structure interaction, but also um, the electromagnetics. Right, so they show up in all these different physics. Yeah. Right? So, um, so it really depends upon the the problem that you're trying to solve as to what physics applies to the particles. Um, one of the interesting things, if you really want to capture cells moving in fluid fluid channels that becomes really complicated because the cell can actually deform right so if you have a deforming particle a non-rigid particle then the challenges become even harder and one of the things that we've done is actually use fluid structure interaction um, where you'd model the cell as a as a solid membrane that has a fluid inside it and a fluid outside it and then the cell is basically incompressible but it is still deformable so, so those those types of problems become really tricky, especially when you're doing the three dimensions. So, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, that, that was great. That's great. And I was gonna say, you know, how does Karthik, you know, how do you guys handle it at uh, Flow Science, looking at the particles in general? You know, it's, the surface is uh, a <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of things going on there. Yeah, there definitely is, and I think that magnetophoretic study sort of is, is testament that sometimes you know a Lagrangian model isn't always the best way to go. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we have uh, we have a pretty powerful uh, Lagrangian particles model. Uh, you know, we have the ability to account for particle masses. So we do. We have mass particles. We have fluid particles. We have gas particles as well. So sometimes what you want to do is you just want to look at things like aeration, for instance. Uh, so slightly different approach, but uh, you know it it becomes useful, especially when you extend it to other physics like um, and if you have dissolution for some reason, uh, you know, things like that. So you can have a species or mass transfer between the two, for instance. Uh, but then uh, on the other side, uh, a bit like some of the additive manufacturing things I showed you, we actually also have a DEM model um, that we use, which is a discrete element model. So you want to account for particle-particle interaction in that case. Um, so you can, you know, those particles tend to have the ability to see each other. And now you're looking at a slightly more computationally intensive problem, but, you know, more capabilities. So, uh, yeah, I guess depending on, on on what's needed, you know, there's a bunch of ways to do it. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Um, kind of the general question, you know, there's uh, a lot of, as Yatian said, there's a lot of, there's a 
people looking to do things outside of lab and you know it really comes down like we saw the the numbers that uh it took for the high speed valve you know pretty pretty intense computer power for those simulations taking days at a time lots of memory you know is, i don't know when when those were done but you know is that is that kind of a current state how what's the current state i guess is the question in terms of computing power that's required uh you know are most people running these things on desktops or dedicated servers or is it moving to the cloud and and uh you know is it kind of in reach of just kind of normal person getting access to doing these calculations yeah yes yeah, so that's a great question don so um so these types of simulations uh if they're multi-physics they tend to have sparse matrices so the matrices tend to be really really large with lots and lots of zeros the problem with sparse matrices is they're very hard to distribute. Yeah. So if you're doing a, a, a smaller model, but many, many different cases, like thousands of cases, then you could send it out to a distributed system, uh, like on the cloud, and they can each do their thing and then comes back. And that's very, very quick or much quicker. But these time dependent 3D multi-physics problems are sparse and you can't parse it out and send it, send it out to a bunch of different computers. So that's really the bottleneck. And that, that's a major problem. Um, it'd be nice if you could distribute it, but it's very difficult. So, um, so we tend to run these on quad core servers uh, that are local and they tend to do a pretty good job. Um, it's about as good as you can, go, you can do. So it doesn't, it doesn't help to go to the cloud. At least that's been my experience. And uh, Karthik may have a different perspective. Yeah. Other now, as we as we pass it over, maybe you can get him comment on which types of problems are you know any examples of problems in this space that would work in the cloud versus uh, having your own system. Yeah, yeah. So if you're doing like a parametric sweep of uh, let's say you have one particular problem, but you want to sweep a bunch of different parameters, uh, and so let's say you have uh, you want to do diff uh, several hundred cases of that where you're changing the size slightly, and you want to see how how the different size or different geometries or fluid viscosities affect the result. Then, and each of these solutions don't depend on the other, they're independent. Then those are very distributable. And those are ideal for the cloud. Because then you can send it to a hundred different computers, they can all do their job and then you can send it all back. But if those hundred computers have to talk to each other to get to exchange information in real time, uh, it's, it's not very efficient. Yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I guess I guess it's uh, for us, we've, we've seen differently in the industry because um, I guess, I mean, I'm pretty sure, Carl, depending on the problem, you know, that that definitely is the case because scaling is not uniform, you know, based on based on what you're running. Um, and uh, in, in our case, we see that it's, it's problem specific for sure, but uh, we try to think of it in terms of what physics models we're using. Um, and for the most part, for things like microfluidics, uh, you know, surface tension and, and viscosity type problems tend to be dominant. So, you know, one case that uh, we saw quite recently was with an inkjet uh, problem where you had uh, sort of a thermal inkjet case, similar to the one I showed in the talk. Uh, we have droplet generation there. And uh, I think that one, uh, we did some scaling studies and we normalized, if you if you take something like, you know, running it on, on a typical workstation, like a 16 core workstation, um, you know, I believe it's something like uh, uh, 24 hours that it takes on there. Uh, going up to around uh, you know 80 or, or 120, it goes down to about half that time. So it's never always twice. Uh, 2x is you know pretty optimistic, I would say. Uh, but in some cases we it, we do see you know in most cases we do see a beneficial a benefit in in runtime uh, you know going on on high performance computing platforms. Uh, the other side of that is uh, you know some of the other applications we do have really large problems uh, with uh, multi million cells, um, hundreds of millions in fact. And in those cases, running locally is not even an option. You kind of have to set it up on really powerful. Uh, Hardware. So we do spend a fair amount of our efforts in parallelization, um, and it's it's yielded results because uh, you know at some point, uh, you know people have touched the big B, uh, you know gone up over a billion cells for certain kinds of uh, cases. But again, it's physics dependent, uh, model dependent, and depending on you know what you want to do, you know, could be a very viable solution. Interesting. Just kind of follow up, maybe Carl can follow on that because you've got a, a lot of these things going. with the uh, you know Carl was talking about doing a parametric study and you had that in your discussion as well is there with the with the power that's out there and with the you know the cost of cloud things coming down to what degree is automated optimization uh, kind of a, a 
option in this, you know, following a particular parameter that somebody has in mind rather than just running through the entire set. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's something that a lot of people have done and, and keep doing. Um, right now, uh, we have some, we don't really have an optimization tool coupled with it, but we do club in with certain codes out there. Like, uh, uh, I believe it was cases or something like that, which, uh, you know, we, there was a it was a hook basically for Flow 3D. Uh, but even uh, simplistic ways of doing it, for instance, uh, if, you're, if you want to do something more complex, like, you know, run it through a neural net or something, that's going to be hard to do. Uh, but uh, if you really want to just, uh, do some iterative studies on certain parameters. Uh, you know the input files are accessible to you, so you can. You know, I do this sometimes where I write a Fortran code and just like uh, sweep through a certain set of parameters and then uh, create all those input files and, and run them in, in bulk. So uh, yeah, that, those options are definitely there, and um, you know you can leverage it. Um, and hopefully we'll we'll get a more integrated solution with that at some point in the future. Yeah, and we saw a little bit on the the console side from. Carly had some pictures of how the what the workflow is kind of like. Is it a, for the for the flow sciences package? Is that something that people it's pretty easy to to set up? You have to be a. I, I'm just I was thinking about the the participant list. We got guys who clearly are fluidics experts and do lots of modeling, and then there are people who probably would love to have some modeling capability. I mean, what other knowledge do you have to have coming in? If you got a CAD package, it looks like both can pull in your CAD model and and set up a grid for you, and then you've got some physics around it. Uh, do you have to be a pretty, pretty savvy expert in the fluid mechanics and the physics of it to make it work right, or is it uh, it's been GUI's been put in place to make it? Yeah. Was it yeah. uh, microfluidics for dummies in my case? Probably, yeah. right? Well, in the case of console multiphysics, this is what uh, we've been using for a number of years. Uh, there is an optimization module that you can purchase that that readily couples to microfluidics or okay. electromagnetism things like that. Um, and it really depends on the degree of the problem um, as to how much of an expert you have to be to actually use it. Uh, there's, there's usually lots of example problems that you can copy from. So if you have one that's close and you can copy it and then just change it a little bit, then, then that's not a problem. But a lot of times, uh, especially with optimization, uh, it, it's somewhat of an art form as well as just straightforward. So it's something that you have to kind of work with and, and manipulate to get useful results um and so yeah so it, it really depends upon the degree of the problem as to how how much of an expert you have to be okay yeah i mean i absolutely agree um i, I was I don't know if I if I told you this, Don, but I think I was setting up a simulation uh, today, and it took me three minutes to set it up. But that doesn't mean it's a good simulation, you know. I mean, the, the workflow is one thing where you know the the codes are made to to make it easier for you to do things. But uh, obviously, you know, CFD needs to be used as I like to say responsibly, uh, so that you kind of know what you're doing and understand this. So so yeah. Uh, in terms of ease of use, at least the way we like to look at it is we try and make it as straightforward as it is for the user to you know, go through this. So you don't need to have a PhD to learn how to set up or use this for simulations. Um, and then uh, a lot of the, uh, the detail about the model itself. So uh, in many cases, if I don't really know how a model is treating a certain aspect of a problem, uh, you know, we have a theory manual where you go in and you kind of know exactly what physics are in there. Uh, so those sorts of things are very, I think, very important so that people know, you know how you're doing certain problems as well yeah and just uh you know one of the, one of the key things i just want to follow up on maybe one or two and i'll, I'll switch over and start getting the uh, audience questions the um a lot of the you know both the packages are fairly expensive but so maybe you know i know with carl with the example on the the valve you know how many cycles did you have to go through and were you able to help drive the design on the uh the fast switching valve for example and then maybe an example you know, what's the you know typical criteria that forces you to get to where the return on investment for a package like that really makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So for uh, for the valve, that one is particularly well suited for simulation in terms of designing the spring constant of the silicon spring, really getting the dynamics, understanding what the fluid is going to do, the magnetics. Um, those things are microfabricated in a in an industrial foundry at IMT, and the runs are quite expensive. So each time you do a design run or a fab run, it, it's there's a lot of lead time. It takes several months to go through the process. It's, there's a lot of cash up front. So there it makes a lot of, and then once you get the result, uh, you know, so, so even with uh, micro PIV and being able to, to see the fluid mechanics, the fluid motion inside it, it's still very hard to see. 
because the dynamics are so fast and, uh, and the scale blank scales are so small. So that particular case really relies a lot on um, simulation because just the iteration time uh, that it takes to set up the experiment, to, well, to build the valve, set up the experiment, see what you, what's going on, evaluate it, and then pro propose a new design. That, that time cycle would be six months to a year for each iteration. So you need simulation. You just can't do it any other way. And then you uh, settle on three or four different designs, actually in these cases, maybe 20 designs, put them all on the uh, wafer, build it, and then test 20 different things and see which one works, right? So, so simulation is absolutely critical. There might be other cases if you're a PhD student in a lab and you're building a very simple experiment, you might be able to repeat that experiment with slightly different um, parameters much quicker in a few days, maybe, or, or a week. And then simulation is useful, but it may not be near as critical. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna switch over now. I think, uh, you know, that's the, uh, let me see where we got. I saw a couple of good questions here. Actually, I saw one question came up that, that I was gonna ask and it, uh, Mark, Mark Unger, I see is on there, had a question about the, the valve as well. Maybe, um, let's see, I don't think I can, can I do that? No, let's see, is Adam's in the unmuting? Maybe Unger, right. Mark, Mark Unger to ask that question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, I think you, you started, you, you answered this, I think in, in part a bit, and I was thinking for both, this is for both Carl and, uh, and Karthik. Uh, so, you know, I haven't done a lot of simulation um, and, and, you know, for someone who's relatively new to simulation, maybe is the, is the right way to cast this. Like when would you suggest that, you know, someone who's new to simulation might go after some, uh, use some simulation tools versus when, when you say uh, uh, advise them to, to not right, and I think there's there's probably some rules of thumbs. Like if it has these features of the problem, it's probably uh, unsuitable for for simulation, or going to be really hard, or consult the professionals versus uh, uh, you know some other characteristics might make it eminently um, um, uh, simulable. So, what would you say? <laughs> okay, so um, so that's that's pretty open ended. So there's a lot there's a lot of a lot of ways this can go. Um, one of the things to think about is um, whether that particular problem is well described by second order PDEs, right? So, so there's certain experiments, certain problems where we just don't have enough information to capture it accurately with the equations, or we don't know the material properties or things like that, that we just don't know that would, so there's certain problems that aren't well posed with current simulation tools for one thing. But let's say you have a problem that is well posed by a simulation tool. Uh, then it's a question of timing. How long does it take to do an experiment? Uh, how long does it take to do the simulation, right? So for the micro valve, it would take months to have an iteration on the design. So, uh, and very expensive. So in that case, simulation is well worth it. And interestingly enough, when we started this simulation, it wasn't clear that we could actually simulate it because it's a very complicated problem. So, uh, so it, and it actually did surpass the capabilities of the simulation tool for a while. And about, uh, and, um, and then a, a couple of updates um, happened in Comsol and all of a sudden it actually worked. So you have to find that balance as to which one is used easier to do. Uh, at the end of the day though, they're both helpful if you can do it. There's a, a saying in analytical chemistry that um, that is, uh, Theory guides, experiment decides. So the theory can give you guidance, the simulation can give you guidance, but the experiment tells you reality. And oftentimes it's both sides of the equation. The simulation may not give you the exact right answer because you don't have the exact right inputs, but it can give you guidance and give you insight into the physics. And then the other side of the equations, the experiments can actually give you the, the real results, assuming the experiment's right, right? Which, you know, both could be wrong, right? But uh, but assuming that they're they're both right or reasonably right, you can learn from each, from both of them. So it's like getting two sides of an equation to balance. That's yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely, Carl. I think totally agree with that. Um, I think the other you know side of it that that we see a lot too is 
if you if you're unsure as to you know which direction to go in and even at a preliminary stage uh, you know the comparative uh, benefits that simulation gives you is is very powerful um, in, in many cases you know you, you sometimes you have to be a little creative at least in terms of if you have a particular problem uh, and, and like you mentioned Carl if you don't necessarily have the full detail of the physics that you need to solve it um, you know you can you can make certain approximations of course you need to know what you're doing when you do that but once you once you have that you you can get a lot of insight into which direction to move in um, as an initial stage. And then once you've validated something, you know, that's also a very, uh, very good way to try and uh, push things to certain off design conditions. For instance, if you want to see uh, how a certain system behaves under something you haven't designed it for, um, you know, same, once you have a reliable validated model, that's a very good basis to extend into uh, something that, you know, you can explore uh, after that. So yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, that's a sort of scenario where it would, where it would work. Uh, I don't really know if I can comment where you wouldn't need simulation, um, but I guess that would, um, you know, that would depend on something. If it's faster for you to just go into the lab and make it, you know, I would say you really don't need to simulate it. Uh, you know, that's probably a, a go-to sort of thought process. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. I think we get, uh, looks like uh, David Charlotte. Can you pop him open there, Adam? And David can ask a question. Oh yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, I was just uh, curious to know a little bit more about the Flow 3D. I've I've used Comsol for uh, kind of a biophysical simulation, microfluidics. Uh, I was wondering, does your the Flow 3D uh, enable uh, like DEP and other electrokinetic phenomenon also to be uh, coupled with the flow dynamics? Uh, yes, actually. So we do have an electromechanics. Uh, it's not a module per se, we're not modular. So we just have a model uh, that's built into the code as well. And you can do things like uh, dielectrophoretic simulations, um, as well as electroosmosis type problems where you have, you know, uh, sort of a, a dielectric property driving uh, the flow essentially. So yeah, that, that model is available uh, in the code. And is it is it editable to uh, kind of reflect when, um, I mean, the at least the problem that I recognize with the dielectrophoretic theory is we're still making up the formulas, even though there's formulas that have been around for a long time, but there's still some subtleties to what actually is happening with these nanoparticles or microparticles to some extent. Is there flexibility uh, in, your, in your software suite for uh, tweaking those parameters as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, uh, we do have uh, what we call customization hooks that are built into to different models. I actually don't know particularly if there's one for the DEP model, uh, but essentially what it allows you to do is write some small snippets of custom code uh, for replicating you know, some of those, like you said, if there are some specific equations you want to put in. Uh, so yeah, so that option is definitely there. Uh, I have to probably go back and check which one is available for. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's go with, uh, looks like Daniel holland Moritz had a question early in the uh, session. Let's go back up to that one. So, uh, Daniel? Hi, uh, my question is for Professor Meinhardt. And uh, I have a, a little bit of a background in um, droplet microfluidics and specifically dielectrophoretic sorting, but I'm familiar with SAC sorting techniques for cell sorting. And I was curious if you could uh, give us an idea of what you see as the biggest advantages of your um, microfab sorting your magnetic sorting device. I, I thought it's really cool, um, but I'm curious what the major advantages of that over to over fax sorting are. Yeah, yeah, and and to be clear, it's not my sorter; <laughs> it's uh, Milton's um, uh, sorter. And so, from what I understand, what they tell me is the main advantage is that it's a sterilized, self-contained cartridge, uh, and that the uh, fax sorters, the gold standard, has been around for you know, a long time, what 40, 50 years. Uh, and it, it's very high throughput, um, but it also, um, the cells can actually go into the room. So it can actually, uh, it's not a self-contained sterilized system. So, um, so yeah. the, the risk is the aerosolization of the cells during the sorting. The risk of what? The risk of aerosolization of the cells yes. during, right. okay. That's, that's, what, that's what they tell me uh, is, um, is one of the major advantages. So everything's self-contained inside the microfluidic cartridge. And I think there's, there's some um, evidence that they talked about where it also uh, doesn't damage the cells as much. So the fax sorters uh, pretty hard on cells and, and can cause some damage. So that's, that's what I understand the main advantages. 
Yeah, as, as I got, yeah, as I told you in the, our earlier conversation, the it's one of my favorite little valves out there. The uh, the simulations got it all the way through to the thing. What happened? Why would it, why did it take so long to commercialize? Any idea why? Everything takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it should, just right? You say, oh yeah, well, we can do that in a couple of years, but uh, yeah, they have a beautiful my, fab. My so. understanding is the history. They started out um, uh, under DARPA contracts at IMT in the early yeah. in the early two thousands, and um, and then it just it just takes a long time to evolve the technology and and improve the the fabrication processes are fairly novel, um, and then um, um, yeah, and then branching off into another company, and then also um, and then also the design, getting it to actually function. Once you get the fab down, how do you actually make the fluid mechanics work the way you want it to work and tune it, and and then you have to build an instrument around it as well. So it isn't just the valve; it's everything around that that supports it yeah. So, yeah. and studies fda studies and i mean it's there's a lot to it yeah the, the getting the hardware to work is only a small small step sometimes so right all right let's go uh nicholas castano you had a question um let's see can we free him up and go ahead nicholas still there hopefully he's still around Seems still on the list from Nicholas Castano from uh, Stanford. Yeah. There you go. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk with you. It's uh, very interesting. I have a question for Karthik. Um, I think you guys touched on this a little bit already, but I was wondering if you could comment as unbiasedly as possible on the advantages and disadvantages of uh, Flow 3D for microfluidic simulations over console. Oh yeah! Wow, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, so I personally haven't used much of Comsol, so I don't know how much of a comparison I can provide. Uh, but I do know some of some of the strengths, at least in terms of the way we do things in, inside Flow 3D. So, uh, you know, one being the ability to handle free surfaces. You know, that's one of those things that uh, we see over and over again because we're sort of I think finite volume based uh, in terms of uh, handling free surface microfluidics. Um, you know, so that's a very big, uh, big strength. Um, and then in terms of uh, handling surface tension, for instance, we have a contact angle model, um, which is uh, fully dynamic. So, you know, it, uh, it's not, you prescribe some certain static contact angles, but the solver actually computes uh, in a transient fashion, what the free surface profile looks like. So for problems such as the uh, the one that I showed you with the uh, uh, with the necking case, uh, that's absolutely critical because you, know, you do have that intricate balance of, of uh, surface tension, inertial forces, all those sorts of things. Um, and it's a fully transient solver all the time. So there's a I guess that's a benefit and maybe in some cases a disadvantage because you have to solve the full uh, transients of the simulation. Um, but uh, I think the methods that we use are also well suited to the way we do things. Um, and then on top of that, I guess all the other multi-physics uh, capabilities that, that are built in. Now, I know Comsol is very powerful in terms of multi-physics, but I know we also have a, quite a few models there that couple with the free surface fluid dynamics. Um, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this, but but really, uh, I mean, there are certain strengths and 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 uh, weaknesses, you know, with with any code. Um, I guess it depends on the kinds of problems that you want to do. Uh, you know, specifically where uh, it might be easier to comment. I don't know, Dr. Minard, if you wanted to add, you know, something about Comsol in terms of, uh, you know, strengths or, or weaknesses. Yeah, um, so one of the things, one of the major differences, so I, I don't represent Comsol, so I'm not a Comsol commercial. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, one of the things that Comsol does is they use a finite element, a strictly finite element simulation. In terms of free surfaces, the physics is either a level set method to, do, to track the, the phases, or uh, a phase field method. Uh, the advantage of finite element is it tends to be more accurate that, uh, because it, of, the, of the numerical algorithms. The disadvantage is that you can't do large scale problems. So finite element gets very big, very fast. So if you're doing uh, uh, real industrial problems that are large, particularly once you get outside microfluidics, things like the finite volume are actually the industry standard because you can do much, much larger problems like flow over an automobile or things like that or highly turbulent problems. Um, at least that's my experience. But, uh, but Comsol is more restricted to smaller domains where finite element, uh, you, you can still keep the, um, the, the problem size relatively small. Okay, great. Let's see, we get one more, one more question from the audience and we'll do, start doing the flip over. So uh, there's a question here from uh, Ram. Ram? You know, open up his uh, line there. 
Adam. There we go, Reb. Let's see, is he on mute? There you go. Input, input. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, go I just ahead. wanted to have a brief input on where a former electrical engineer can contribute to this field, you know. Um, my background has been in, in the design of microprocessors in the past. And uh, I've been hearing a lot about application of sort of uh, electronic design automation uh, skills or technologies to help, I don't know, co commercialize the microfluidic system design perhaps. So in that vein, I was thinking if there are any ways you can uh, characterize some of these elements, like you said, the switches is one example, or the the, uh, the the rate at which the fluids uh, pass through a channel, if these can be characterized into predefined kind of models that we normally use in ASIC designs, for example, where we have a whole bunch of libraries that we create that, has, that have gone through tons of simulations. And we have a portfolio of those libraries that we can use into a CAD system to design a complete system, for example. So can some of these things be characterized into those pre-characterized libraries, for example? Like, for example, switches. Can there be like 10 variants of switches that does one thing or the other uh, that we can be captured into a portfolio of library, for example? I, I think that question, people have been posing that for a while. It's like, how do you standardize microfluidic components the way electrical engineers have done electronics? Uh, and, uh, and I know a number of companies have tried to do that as well. Uh, it seems to me that each problem is somewhat unique and, and microfluidics is quite diverse. And so it's been very difficult to standardize into a set of libraries for different components. I mean, some components you can, like, like uh, droplet generators, there's a certain class of droplet generators that work for certain class of problems, but it, it's, I don't know, it's hard to, um, it's hard to just to standardize uh, as electrical engineers have, but that's been my experience. But. Would you attribute that to just the variation in the, you know, the, the fluids and any sort of substrate? Basically, every single time you do something, you have something different or for the most part, right? Yeah, I, I, I see the same thing as well. It's a, um, there, there, there are ongoing conversations within the, uh, the microfluidic community. They're trying to come up even something as simple as standardized port spacings so that uh, things like that can happen much less all of the things internal because each application, whether it's cells or DNA or proteins or particles, the, the, the different challenges on how you're moving fluid versus, I think it's a, it's a, eventually okay. you know things will happen but it'll be a uh, probably market by market in some ways and and some of the regulations about standardization are kind of tricky when you start moving into med device companies don't necessarily want things standardized for safety reasons so so it's not not as simple as uh, the electron moving around uh, unfortunately i think it would be great okay i think um yeah, I guess, uh, the... yeah go ahead yeah, I guess the only thing I can uh, comment is uh, when you do this uh, modular design, you kind of compromise on performance. That's what happens in the microprocessor world where if you do everything by custom, you get the maximum performance you could get out of the CPU. But then if you uh, turn that into a sort of an object model, then the problem can be addressed by multiple people. You know, that uh, problem domain expands, application domain expands a little bit. Right. Maybe it's a bit too early right now for that, I guess. Yeah, I'd say, you know, as it, as it moves into markets where, you know, there there is a more routine workflow, then you'll see something like that. I don't know. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's see. We've kind of, uh, we've gone through the, the Q&A. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. Um, and for the great answers, especially. Uh, I think, you know, we've been pretty lucky, as, as Yatian said at the beginning, we have a couple of really awesome talks. And a lot of good, a lot of good feedback and discussion here. It's uh, pretty clear that we've got a uh, 
a lot of amazing capabilities. It's really improved since uh, 25 years ago in terms of uh, simulations when microfluidics started. And uh, you know, with the continually increasing, <laughs> like continually increasing access to computer power and a lot more time in front of our computers instead of in the labs, uh, probably some good opportunities for people to think about concepts that have been on their minds and see if they can prove them out a bit and uh, get things moving forward. So, um, thanks everyone again. I'm going to hand it back over now. I think to either Yatian or Thomas. Thank you very much, Don. And thank you to uh, Carl and Karthik, excellent talks, and also for everyone for sticking around. I'm sorry we're running a few minutes behind here. So we have five job opportunities that we're going to now present. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. So the first one is actually from Flow Sciences, Flow 3D. Karthik, would you like to say a few words about this? Um, sure. So uh, I believe there's, there should be two openings. Um, you know, we're, we're hiring, uh, we're looking for somebody with a CFD background for CFD engineer. So this is uh, somebody with a, a general fluid dynamics background um, and preferably with a, with a master's or PhD. Um, in fact, we like to say like most of our company is full of CFD engineers. So, you know, it's just like joining the family. Uh, and then we're also looking for an HPC developer. So someone who has um, expertise with uh, parallelization, um, you know, H working on HPC platforms, uh, those sorts of things. So um, if you're interested, we're based here in New Mexico in, in Santa Fe, um, which is actually pretty beautiful if you've, if you've never been to the Southwest, uh, you know, the mountains are about half an hour away from here. So um, we we're growing uh, in, uh, we've been growing uh, over the last few years as well. So do check out the openings and, and let me know if there's any questions that come up. Thank you very much. So these links will also be posted in the chat for all of these uh, job postings. So next we have Intabio and uh, did someone from Intabio could, could raise your hand, use the raise yes, hand Natasha. function and I will- Tweet Natasha Popovich. Okay. I'll just have to find that window. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So uh, just a quick word about uh, Intabio. Uh, it's uh, we're developing a microfluidic based, uh, based platform for characterization of intact proteins. It's a very, very interdisciplinary cross-functional environment. And we're, we have a whole bunch of openings, uh, super exciting technology and a great group of people to work with. So we're looking for scientists uh, with background in uh, mass spectrometry and surface science as well. We have an opening for a director of systems integration, uh, incorporating the, the, our um, isoelectric focusing with the mass spectrometry uh, parts of the platform. We're looking for senior data scientist, mechanical engineer, and the senior field service engineer as well. So as you can see, it's, a, it's an exciting time at Intabio and hopefully people will be inspired to join us. Thank you very much. And we have Thermo Fisher next. And is uh, Yakov in the meeting? Mm, I don't see him. Anyway, uh, Thermo is recruiting for a senior staff engineer uh, for systems engineering. And details for that job posting for a job description are now in the, in the Zoom chat. So you can follow that link to learn more about this position. Next, we have Solares. Yep. So again, for this position, um, there will be a link in the chat uh, to a PDF with the job description. So Solares is recruiting a senior mechanical engineer. Okay. And last but not least, we have Mikonos. Uh, Mark, are you still around? Would you like to say something about the position, Mark? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I'm Mark. I'm a recent graduate of the Berkeley Bioengineering Program. Uh, Mechanos is a very early stage microfluidic startup. Uh, we're doing parallelized cell engineering by nanoinjection. It's kind of an exciting hardware platform to work on if you have a microfluidics or MEMS background or are interested in surface chemistry. Um, and we're hiring a microfluidic scientist. So if you want to get in on the ground floor uh, of a startup, 
um, that's doing some interesting work, let me know. And uh, there's also a link there to a uh, uh, job posting. Thank you very much. All right, so we're now on to networking. So how this works is in a second, everyone will be asked to join a breakout room. Uh, please turn your video on for the breakout sessions if you're able to. It's much easier to uh, network when you can see who you're talking to. Uh, feel free to stay and chat as long as you'd like. Um, and if you have any uh, issues or if you want to talk to talk to a specific person or switch rooms, um, use the call host function. Um, everyone filled out who they wanted to talk to on Eventbrite, but I was only able to assign people to rooms if you signed into Zoom also with the same email that you used to register for the event. So that's not everyone. So I apologize if you're not immediately in the room that you wanted to be in. So without further ado, uh, here we go. I think the breakout rooms haven't started yet. I don't okay. see the four squares. Okay, just hold tight. Within the next 30 seconds, everyone will be in a breakout room. <laughs> 